You're listening to the Modern Healthcare Back Office, a podcast dedicated to solving the billing issues and gridlock facing the healthcare industry, presented by ProChant, hosted by Chuck Ellis and Rachel Schools. Well, hey there, folks. Chuck here, and thank you so much for joining us. I am joined today by my co-host, Ms. Rachel Schools. Rachel, how are you doing today? I am fantastic, Chuck. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on this episode. This is our first episode in a series where we will be talking about some of the issues facing the HME industry when it comes to billing. So one of the first things we thought when we kick off this series is we would talk about some of the bad habits that we've either experienced or committed firsthand and how to avoid them. And to do that, we have invited a HME billing expert to join us today along with Rachel and her expertise. So Christina Blythe, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. So Christina, tell us just a little bit about yourself and how you found yourself in the world of HME billing. Okay. So I am Christina Blythe, as you said. I'm originally from Charleston, South Carolina, and currently I reside in Columbia. So that's just a couple hours away. I graduated from the University of South Carolina with a degree in philosophy. I've been in the HME medical billing industry for about 13 years now. So I started out working for one of the large corporations that remains one of the major players in our industry. I spent a few years there in the billing department and was able to gain a lot of experience as I was promoted through different roles. I ended up at ProChant because I wanted a new challenge and saw such potential and promise of our then small company, which has since grown exponentially. So I've been working with ProChant for about 10 years now, and my current role is a reimbursement success advocate. So I do a lot of data analysis and problem solving kind of stuff for our clients here. Wonderful. And uh, for those who aren't that familiar with ProChant, tell us a little bit about how ProChant works and what it does. We have clients all over the country. Typically, we started out with DME providers, so durable medical equipment, things like oxygen and wheelchairs. So what we do is we handle the front end and back end billing functions for these clients of ours. We're basically pursuing as much revenue and cash flow influx for them as possible. We work their claim denials, payment posting, claim transmissions, just kind of everything for these clients. What we do is we handle the revenue cycle for our providers so that they can take care of their mm-hmm. patients. And we essentially make sure that you get paid. We work uh, hard so you don't have to. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We're scrubbing bubbles. Yep. All right. Fantastic. So I think it would be safe to say, Christina, that you know a little bit about HME billing. Is that right? I hope so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Uh, and I know Rachel is, is a not just a consultant, but is an expert on this type of topic as well. So I'm really excited about our topic today, which is five bad habits in HME billing and how to fix them. I know we've talked a little bit beforehand about some bad habits that you've seen in the HME billing industry and how they can be easily remedied. Christina, I want you to take the first one. Tell me one of the bad habits that you've experienced most often in HME billing. Okay. How should I put this? Because The issue is not on file claims. Those drive me crazy. So if you're filing Mm -hmm. claims and they aren't getting on file with the insurance company, you have no chance of being reimbursed for them. So the resolution to the not on file claims, in our opinion, is to enroll as much for electronic claim submissions as possible. So that way you have proof that your claims are on file based on the clearinghouse and insurance carriers can't really argue with that if you have that proof. Not on file claims, as I said, a lot of the time they actually lead to past time filing denials. These payers have limits within which you can file your claims. And if you don't meet those timely filing requirements, then you're going to basically lose your revenue. You'll have to have write-offs instead of payments and nobody wants that Mm -hmm. i'm totally feeling it christina Mm -hmm. i want to get into like how did this come up so i am an ar collector 
and I'm following up on a claim that's 45 days mm-hmm. old and it hit my queue for follow up. I pick up the telephone. I look at the claim first and I try to decide, did it actually right. transmit? Do I have proof that the claim was accepted by the insurance carrier? And did I get a response? That's exactly. step one. And we don't see that. So we pick up the phone. We talk to the insurance company and they say, yeah, that's not on file. And what you're saying you find, Christina, I believe, is that a lot of this issue resides in those payers that are not set up for that electronic transmission. Right. But there is a solve for that, too. Yeah. Because right? a lot of the time you can foster a relationship with these insurance representatives that you're speaking to. So if you're doing a lot of air follow-up, you're probably talking to the same people a lot, especially if it's one of those that doesn't accept electronic claims typically going to be maybe a smaller payer or a local one. And so you can oftentimes send things via secure email or fax. And that way you still have the proof electronically that you submitted your claim in a timely manner. So we identify that maybe a provider has a huge issue with not on file claims, which we don't like. How do you attack that problem? If you can get your hands on data, obviously that's ideal. So what you want to do is through the production reports from like your AR team, whoever your AR team is, and they're working these claims, you want to look at what they've worked and then you can find like the payer with the largest amount of non on file claims, whether it's count. Yeah. Whether it's with that one, right? Or dollar amounts, whatever. Just start with one and then work your way through the list. As long as you're addressing the major ones, you're going to find that your cash flow is going to really improve quickly. So I'm hearing we make atomic changes, mm-hmm. little ones, and then eventually exactly. we get through that list. Wonderful. Sounds, sounds genius to me, Chuck. I love it. That is fantastic. <laughs> All right. That's one. Rachel, how about you? Let's talk about a bad habit that you have seen in the industry. Gosh, other than just not getting paid. Exactly. That is the worst habit. <laughs> what is the worst habit? Okay. It's related to what Christina said. So the issue is the same, right? I'm the Mm -hmm. AR collector. And this used to drive me nuts, guys, when I was a collector. I'm the AR collector. I go into the claim because we're all working from some software system that in theory should be keeping track of the transmission of that claim, the response for the transmission of that claim, and the payer's actual official response telling us whether or not they've paid or denied it. So I get into the system, And I see that there is nothing, right? Maybe I can tell that the claim transmitted and it was accepted, but I don't have a denial. In other words, I have no idea why this claim isn't paid. So now I have a couple of options. Option one is I can go find a web portal for this payer and see if I have a login, cross my fingers and pray. And I can go and look up the claim and see if I can check the status that way. I always try that first because... The last thing I want to do is pick up the telephone and talk to an insurance representative. (laughs) So I want to know why it didn't get paid and what I need to do to fix it. Let's say I don't have a web portal to log into. That's often the case. I will pick up the telephone. I contact the insurance company. And then they tell me that it denied for some reason. And then only later to find out that it wasn't that reason it denied, we actually got a letter in the mail telling us very specifically what was wrong with that claim. And not only that, these letters will tell you where to send it back to and how to send it back and which department is waiting for it. And all you really have to do is take that letter and put it on top of whatever they requested and mailed it. But what I find happens is that paper, there's tons of paper coming into the office every day and it might just go sit on somebody's desk. What really should be happening is that stuff should be scanned in electronically and somebody should be breaking that down and tagging it electronically and creating a task for somebody because that would save endless phone calls. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a lot of work though. Let me give you a real example, okay? Okay. So what is digitizing? And you're right. Actually, I get pushed back a lot like when I'm on-site coaching and I'm trying to work with teams to get their workflow changed. That's the first thing everybody says is, that sounds like a lot of work Mm -hmm. to digitize all those records. So let me give you an example of how this works. So a provider has a hundred page, you know, a stack of documents, a hundred pages. Okay. Mm -hmm. And 
One of those documents in there is a three-page explanation of benefits that's all denials, but there's 30-something patients on that one three-page explanation of benefits. It might take me two minutes to go through all three pages and post the denial that's on those pages. But if I'm not paying attention and making sure that I'm breaking those documents down and capturing every piece of it, I missed that one remit. So I didn't post those 30 denials. Now that's 30 telephone calls gotcha. that have to be made. Mm. So you're right. It is a lot of work to digitize it, but I, I don't even know that I could put a value on it, placing <laughs> emphasis on that process in and of itself. That's true. The, the alternative is not getting paid. I take that a step further. Mm -hmm. Not only am I super OCD about the digitizing of paper, I also then go back and run reports on that to figure out how we can eliminate this from happening to begin with. Why are we getting this paper? Why didn't we get this response electronically? Why is this payer asking us for the same things over and over again? And can we not find a way to transmit the claim and then send them whatever they're asking for electronically right away? So we don't have to get a letter. I take that same approach that Christina did with her payers that had not on file issues. And then I apply it to my paper. I look and say, okay, what from where is all of this paper coming from that my team is having to digitize? And then you work through it one at a time. How do I stop this? There's an answer to everyone. What you're talking about in describing Rachel, it sounds like it's what we refer to here as correspondence, right? I don't yeah. know if everybody listening to this would know, but the correspondence pieces that typically come through. So you're going to have some that are explanations of benefits, EOBs that have payments and denials, just like Rachel said, but also several payers will issue uh, a piece of correspondence where they're just requesting, let's say, medical records to support your claim. These um, letters are coming out to providers and they will say, please respond within 30 days. Let's say that. So if you do, you can get your response back to them within that time frame. A lot of the time you can avoid the denial altogether, saving yourself from having to appeal that denial later, call to try and have it reprocessed. So it's really saving you work on the back end if you're doing it on the front end. And then I think the other thing that Rachel, you're, you're saying is with your claims, when your claims are actually going out the door, a lot of the time you can provide medical records or purchase prices or any of those types of things that would be requested. Or a yeah. narrative on your claim. There is a way to keep them from asking you yeah. for that so thing, you, which they're asking you yeah, for. You can, like. The insurance companies, by law, are not allowed to just deny and defer and delay. They do because we haven't figured out how to play their game fully. But they have to give you a path to be able to submit a claim right the first time and get paid. That's number two. So, Christina, it's your turn again. Let's talk about okay. another so this, bad habit. One of the pet peeves that I have mm -hmm. also is timely filing write-offs timely filing denials. So I know we've touched on timely filing a couple mm -hmm. of times here, but I had a client a couple of years ago and he was obsessed with past timely filing write-offs. That was this thing he could not stand. And so he made me really passionate about it too, just working through that problem. And until I worked with him on this, I sort of thought that timely filing write-offs were just sort of part of the game. I'm like, you're going to have some percentage that's written off. And that is certainly the case, but it doesn't have to be due to timely filing. So what we started to do with this particular client is take a look at the write-offs last six months, let's say, and then go ahead and take a sample of those and find out what the root cause to that timely filing is. So did we not confirm the order in time? Did we accidentally regenerate billing that was past timely filing? So it's kind of like junk billing. Those sorts of things, when we identify the root causes, then we can start to address those root causes and prevent them. I think timely filing denials and write-offs, probably anybody in the billing industry would agree. It's just horrible. Like, it's just maddening. <laughs> so there is a solution to it. But again, it's a process. You have to evaluate your data then attribute a root cause, then make sure that you're uh, keeping good records of these things. So what we started to do is take the write-off 
and adjustment codes and make them very specific. A lot of clients, when we go into their systems, they'll have a write-off reason of past time we file it. So what we started to do is put PTFL, order confirms PTFL. So you're including the root cause within the write-off reason. Then you can see which ones rise to the top and you go same way. Just do it one payer at a time or one department at a time. That sort of thing I think is really key in making sure that you're maximizing your revenue. I want to make sure I understood that. So it's not just the timely filing write-off. You mean the write-off mm -hmm. itself, the reason Correct. that was coded yep. was past Very timely rare. filing, right? And this is a data, this is a data problem mm -hmm. right. because that doesn't give us enough information. Is it past timely filing because we didn't get the medical records needed to support medical necessity? Exactly. Is it past time? That's what you're looking for. Okay. Yeah. Huge. Also a huge pet peeve of mine. All right. We are knocking some serious stuff out here. Cool. Rachel, your turn. Number four. Okay. Since Christina went there, I guess my next pet mm. peeve is going to be yes. the whole process. <laughs> oh boy. Yes. Ooh. We're going to burn it all down right here on the show. We're going to burn it all down on this show. What you're, what you'll find about me is I make sure I'm going to get paid first. There is none of this hold and AR and denial. And if there is, uh, I don't care. Every denial I see or every hold I see is a chance for me to go back to the front end and say, what went wrong here? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them. And Christina knows I'm pretty, but the hold process. So first of all, let me explain what that is. In the HME industry, we get a referral from a hospital, okay? And that referral from the hospital will tell us, Miss Jones is being discharged, is going to need oxygen for this reason. Here's some medical records and here's a prescription, okay? And then most of the time, there's something else that you have to do or some official form that you need signed, but you've got this patient that's coming out of the hospital, so you've got to get them that equipment so that they have that equipment with them when they discharge from the hospital, but most of the time you still don't have all the paperwork you need. What happens is you deliver that concentrator <clears throat> to your patient. The order makes it all the way through the process. It then turns into a claim that just sits on hold. And it's on hold because we need something. We might need a form like a certificate of medical necessity or we might need some additional supporting medical records. But either way, we need something from the doctor. This is where my pet peeve comes in. That drops into a queue, and it won't be sorted in any particular order. Mm. And you just start calling. So I'm going to call Dr. Ellis because that just showed up on my list because I have a patient that I need medical records for. So I call Dr. Ellis. And then you tell me, yeah, we don't have any. So I tag it, don't have any, and I put a follow-up for three days. And it just goes into Neverland. A few days later, a few lines later, look, it's Dr. Ellis again. <laughs> so I'm going to call Dr. Ellis and say, hey, <laughs> I, I need some medical records. Like, so it's my pet peeve is more of when I see an outreach process that isn't structured so that you're making the calls by ordering doctor. Because think about it, if you're a healthcare provider and you're located here, and there's probably just a handful of, of referrals that make up most of your referrals. So the pet peeve is making sure that the outreach is structured by doctor. And then oftentimes I see that endless loop. Some providers, they'll just keep calling over and over. Hey, if medical necessity wasn't supported and this patient has your oxygen concentrator, then your policy needs to be pick up the phone, call the patient and say, hey, are you still using this concentrator? Because... We can't bill for it. Number one, could you help us with that? First question, could you help us? Number two, are you still using it? Because a lot of times they aren't. A lot of times the patient will just need something to get home. They might be done. They might be better. So anyway, <clears throat> my pet peeve is a very loose hold management process. Mm. I will talk forever about it. So I'm just going <laughs> to. Perfect. We only got a few minutes left here. So Christina, okay, so number five, what is our that, bad habit to talk about today? If you don't have a feedback loop between the different departments and teams within your company, you're doing it wrong, right? That is absolutely critical. Yes. <laughs> so when you get to like, denial ding, 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 or, ding, ding. or write offs or ding. whatever, you have to feed it back into your front end. And so you create a feedback loop so that all your teams are working toward the same goal 
avoiding the trending problems that you're seeing over and over again. You can even implement error reporting if you'd like to drill down like we were talking about, you know, before. So that feedback loop is critical to make sure that you're getting better and just strengthening your whole process. Well said. So, Rachel, any final thoughts on that? I don't think so. All right. Awesome. That is it for our time today. I want to thank again, Christina Blythe for joining us. If anyone has any questions and wants to follow up with you oh, on this conversation, so, where can they uh, find you? If follow anybody you ever Instagram. wants to contact me, my email address is Christina B, that's C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-A, B as in boy at prochant.com. Please feel free to reach out to Christina with any questions. And again, if you have any questions for us, you can always email me at Chuck Ellis at prochant.com, or you can check us out at prochant.com and find the podcast episodes under the article section of the website. Rachel, any final thoughts today as we close out? I don't think so. I can't wait to dive into these pet peeves. Oh man, we have got so many more pet peeves coming and bad <laughs> habits. We are going to get you all in fighting shape in no time. Yeah. But that's it for today's episode. Again, thank you so much for watching, listening, wherever you are. Please subscribe, rate us on Apple Podcasts, all that good stuff. And until next time, we'll see you soon. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Modern Healthcare Back Office, a presentation of ProChant, a wholly owned revenue cycle management service dedicated to serving HME, pharmacy infusion and other healthcare providers. Learn more about us at ProChant.com.